some time for once, thanks <laughs> to Kundon's punctuality. Um, so many of you know Kunjon Toomey and know that he's knowledgeable in many subjects, especially on East Asian culture and arts. He's lived in Japan and Korea for several years and lived there and then <laughs> previously and then uh, also in Thailand. And um, you may also know that he is a master of is that what you call master of tea ceremony? Tea master, yes, tea in master. two different schools. In, yeah. Korean and Japanese. But not yet Thai. Oh, well, there isn't one. <laughs> oh, I do go to a Thai Chinese tea master, Kun Jong Rak. I think you will probably know him. The uh -huh. NMB has dealings with him, but the at homes. At homes uh, so maybe program. one day. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> maybe one day, yes, yes. But I think his special and most long lasting passion is on Mother of Pearl. Yes. Um, and we're lucky to have him to speak for us today on this subject. Oh, thank you. Okay, so I give the microphone and please welcome John to me. Thank you. It was worth the three-hour taxi drive to come here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I really do love this subject. And um, you might uh, want to understand the meaning of mother of pearl. Uh, the other word that we use for it is N-A-C-R-E, nacre, nacre. Uh, it's, it's made up of, what well, I'm going to explain to you scientifically, the different layers and what makes the iridescence, the kind of luminescent uh, effect of the, uh, the shell on the inside, especially in the inner, innermost parts. So, mother of pearl inlaid lacquer was traditionally reserved exclusively for the court and the cloister, so the court and the monasteries, in Thailand. And it irradiates its fiery glow throughout the history of the fine arts, trade, and diplomatic relations in the Far East. Well, that's a lot. The fine arts, you would expect, but trade and diplomatic relations, very important is tributary gifts to and from China. So it has an ancient history of development as one of the highest forms of artistic expression. Unfortunately, when we think of Mother of Pearl, we usually think about carnival trinkets, you know, uh, Mother's jewelry box with the dancing lady, sort of, sort of thing. <laughs> That's not what it was in Thailand at all. It was a very, very high art and uh, we have a Mother of Pearl room at the National Museum, and in it is the collection of Prince Padibatra. Um, at the moment, it is closed, and I did contact the curators to ask them if they could bring a few pieces here, like they did the last time I talked. And, and I wanted you to see that date, 2013, because I'm told that there are some new guides here, and I want them to know that even in 2013, I was training guides in, in Mother of Pearl lacquer. So it's not, something, it's not something new, it's something that everybody seems to have an interest in and want to know more about. So these, this ex artistic expression spanned all the cultures of Asia and even in Europe. Now you might wonder in Europe, where are they going to get a lacquer tree? Well, uh, my friends have planted some there in Europe, but that's not enough, it's just symbolic. Actually, the Europeans don't use the lacquer tree that I'm going to show you in a moment. They use different oils and resins from other trees. Um, for example, in the Munster Museum of Lackkunst, the Lackerware Museum in Munster in Germany, it was part of the collection of um, Marie Antoinette and some of her pieces of lacquer. Those were all made from European resins and oils. And uh, that activity is still going on today. They're still making them in Europe that way today. But in every country, lacquer comes from a few varieties of the sumac tree. But the species depends on the country. English uses a very common Japanese word uh, for urushi. We call it urushi ol. Urushi o. Urushi means lacquer in Japanese, and urushi o is the, the lacquer juice or the, the material that's used to lacquer cabinets and other pieces. 
Um, the earliest uh, treatise on lacquer was written by Zhu Zundu from China's Five Dynasties era, 907 to 960, but it did not survive to the present. MOP, that's a convenient term that we use to refer to Mother of Pearl, MOP was used in Thailand as far back as the Devadavadi period in the 9th and 10th centuries at Utong in Supanburi province, according to Boisselier. Boisselier was the French archaeologist, and he did at one time uh, work at the National Museum in Bangkok as a, a curator or, dir or director during that time. And, but the technique at that time in Devaravati was not as refined as it is today. The Devaravati craftsmen use whole rough shells in round or ring shapes or shapeless platelets of shells to inlay the architectural stucco like around the doorway um, which had already been uh, lacquered black. Okay, so let's move on. Here's the uh, the tree is called usually Rus Vinicifera, or Vinicifera in Japan. Um, here in uh, Thailand, they use Melanoria usitata, which is a kind of juicier, fatty, more heavy uh, sort of a lacquer, more wet kind of lacquer. And um, both are, are used in China, or were used in China. We're not so sure what the Chinese are doing with lacquer right now. I'm trying to keep up with that. But I know what the Koreans are doing because I go there to check on them once in a while, and the Japanese too. But um, these, uh, uh, other than this use of shells to inlay the eyes, now here you see, oh, it's the next slide, isn't it? Okay, <laughs> that's better, all right. <laughs> The eyes of Buddhist statues in Hindu. Now this is Shiva, so it's Hindu or Brahmin. So Mother Pro is was used to inlay the eyes. I also had photos of the uh, the Buddhist statues with inlaid eyes, but they were too blurry, so I didn't put them up. But this is a magnificent bronze statue. Oh, a little story about this: a Lutheran minister who was visiting the Kampong Pek Museum fancied this, so he cut off the head and tried to export it to America. He got caught at the border, thankfully. <laughs> oh, what a world we live in. <laughs> so the, um, other than this kind of use, we can't trace a continuity or a tradition of shell work from Devadavati to the later pieces. There simply wasn't nothing written and not much done except the sort of inlay in the eyes. So we have to look for the early origins of and influences on Thai MOP inlay in the development of this art elsewhere. We have to look outside of Thailand to find out. We can presume that the Thais learned to refine lacquer and MOP inlay from examples they saw and handled since at least the Ayutthaya period from the surrounding countries, including at least China. But what role, if any, did Vietnam, Burma, or even Japan, the Ryukyus, which is present-day Okinawa, and Korea play in this process? Well, archaeological evidence shows that finely cut, though thick, MOP was used as ornament in China in the Anyang period, about 1300 BCE. And Chinese records say that MOP was very fine in the early Tang, uh, but Naoko Kinoshita, one of the greatest scholars, posits that it had declined so badly by the 9th century that the Japanese were reverse exporting their MOP lacquer made with Ryukyu and turban shells. The shell that's used is the great green turban shell. I'll give you the scientific name later. So the Japanese now were outstripping the Chinese and exporting to China. Um, and this was happening um, bef uh, before uh, 1462. And in 1462, uh, oh, sorry, uh, Korea had not yet developed the art. That was later, much later. 
But in 1462, Wang Zhou wrote that the very best of Song and Yuan pieces, uh, maybe we should go back. Yes, oh, sorry. This, oh, I see. There it is. <laughs> it's tricky. My computer doesn't work like this. <laughs> so here you see um, a song piece, which is very, very refined. Uh, uh, plum blossom, uh, plum blossoms on a branch, and Yuan in the upper right hand corner. So these finest ones, uh, where inlaid lacquer was produced in the village of Jiangxi province. In the existence of MOP food boxes, here you see a stacked food box. Now the Japanese still use these at New Year's holiday because women are not allowed to cook at New Year's, it's their time to rest. So before New Year's, they cook all the food and put them in stacked boxes and visitors can just help themselves to whichever layer of food they want to. So these were food boxes in China also, but most likely used to hold a special sweets for tea, to go along with tea. And uh, in the tea ceremony, we still use this kind of stack box to pass the tea cakes around in a formal tea ceremony, but not in an informal one. Okay, so um, this reminds us of uh, the Thai MOP Lung food boxes, and I think I'll skip ahead just, um, oh, yes, yes, this is the next one. Here, here it is. This is a Lung food coffer with Lai Thai. Lai Thai means Thai design, and the Tepanom, the 20th century collection of Prince Paribacha in the National Museum. As Don had mentioned, the uh, flame, the kranok, is very, very important in defining the tepanong and also in other areas. This particular flower, the four petal flower, is called the prajamyan. It's a, sort of a sacred or lucky flower uh, in Thai arts. So these are not only in mother pro inlay, but in textiles, in ceramics, uh, in paintings. And uh, the Kranok is very versatile. You can make anything by putting Kranoks together. And they do. They make tepanoms, they make angels, they make people, they make all kinds of things just by enlarging the flame or attaching other flames to it. So it's a basic design. Around the bottom, you see little dots. And uh, I had questions about this. I thought this was a string of pearls because of Sasanian influence. Kunhule point at the Siam Society told me, no, that's fish eggs representative of fertility, which was a surprise to me. It was very, very interesting. So, um, yes, but the Chinese MOP, though it may have had some early indirect influence on this art in Thailand, it didn't have much of any direct influence due to many political reasons, basically because the Chinese hated everybody else and <laughs> didn't want to trade with them, but they wanted their goods. <laughs> so we'll get into that later. Um, but uh, until the reign of Rama the Third, which is 1824 to 51, and he invited Chinese to come, so significant numbers of immigrants came to Thailand and of course they brought the, uh, their boxes uh, along with them. So at any rate, the quality, uh, should go to the next one now. Uh, did I get that right? Uh, in the upper right hand side, we can see, oh, no, that's the next slide. This confuses. <laughs> there we go. These are uh, in the Jim Thompson house and I got these from my permission from the Jim Thompson guides. Who, to whom I gave the same lecture that you're giving today. And uh, here's Chinese style MOP, rather haphazard. Uh, when the Jim Thompson guides asked me to evaluate the MOP that was there, I said, well, really don't need to mention it. <laughs> but um, the ties were doing much better than this by this time. So the quality of Thai lacquer of the earlier periods, because it was made for royal and ecclesiastical use, 
was often much better than the quality of the third reign, Rama the third, uh, pieces with Chinese influence. The main reason for its lack of direct influence on Thai lacquer is that China, for many centuries, considered itself just too big to be bothered with, ever, with anybody. It considered itself to be the center of the world and in no need of anything from outside the Middle Kingdom. It always said it didn't need the tribute, but they always took it when it was offered. <laughs> and so they didn't encourage trade other than to accept tribute from foreign states as recognition of Chinese supremacy. Indeed, not only did they not consider trade, but they didn't allow trade for long periods when China expressly forbade its artisans, merchants, and shippers to trade outside its borders and severely punished those who dared to do so with death. As far as the style, design, ornamentation, and technique, we may look again to the ties themselves for originality and quality and also to influences beyond China, which we shall soon, add, soon address. Oh, the next one. Okay. Oh yeah, that's some more of the Chinese. You can see a dragon uh, motif here and the phoenix motif. Um, uh, just in case you don't know, in ancient uh, art history. The meaning of this is East China and West China. The totem for the tribes in East China was the uh, snake and the totem for West China was the bird. Well they developed these into more powerful images because they were fighting the East and the, the Warring States period, East and West China. And the um, snake developed into the powerful dragon, and the bird developed into the phoenix. So they've been at war, and you can see this, you National Museum volunteers can see this still, the uh, Garuda fighting with the snakes. So this is all sort of connected. But eventually during the Shia prehistoric period, uh, these two did make some kind of compensation with the uh, uh, kind of to, to getting together and having a unified state. All right, so the gold underlay. Now, the particular technique that's used here is that gold leaf is placed under the shelf. But the Chinese did it in a rather um, sloppy way, I have to say, but I'll tell you about that so right now. Um, this uh, example of uh, MOP shows, it actually involves grinding the shell very thinly and then crushing it and laying it over the gold leaf which has already been laid onto the lacquer to allow the gold to show through from behind the translucent crushed shell. So we know it was made by the most popular lacquer artist of the day whose name was Zhang, Zhang Li and represents the beginning of a revival in the quality of technique though it may still be judged a bit decadent in style. As a teaser, compare it with this Ryukyuan piece, this Ryukyuan ritual offering table, where the mother of pearl is not crushed, but is put together in a much more organized and aesthetic manner. And it shows, the Ryukyuan piece from the same period shows more restraint and elegance. Chinese MLP became less delicate, less refined as time passed. Note how the platelets become larger, even grosser, and less detailed as the centuries went on. And the next one, you can see that even more, how flat and utterly lackluster the pieces are. The Thai 
uh, that will appear much more colorful because of the shell that they use, which I will explain to you. So the uh, Chinese MLP was already becoming decadent in the sense of overly crowded, and this technique had declined into shortcuts of mass production to satisfy the market demand, while at the same time, what China considered its tributary states were outstripping China in the quality of their lacquer. For example, Japan and Korea were doing much, much better at that time. A look at some of the Korean pieces. On the left is a, a rosary case. You know, the Buddhists use rosaries uh, in Mahayana Buddhism, 10th to 9th century. You can see how very, very delicate it is. Um, and on the right, uh, there are some more rosary cases with a, uh, oh, sorry, that's the next slide. with the Om symbol, the Hindu Om symbol, um, which is in the center here, but this is from the top. Uh, I took all these photos myself in various museums. Um, but you can see how the Korean technique is to cut small pieces and lay them side by side as like pieces of string or needles. And that's why this is called string lacquer. In Korean, it's, it's pronounced najang chilgi. Chilgi is lacquer, and najang is this kind of uh, rainbow effect that you get when you lay the string-shaped uh, pieces next to each other to make the design, the floral designs. Note that the entire surface, surface is covered with tiny strings forming arabesques of vegetal or flower scrolls, which we will see also in Thai MOP later. So Korea had a great influence on Thai MOP because they used the same uh, scrolls, the lotus scrolls, were used in Korea first and then later uh, in Thailand, became very popular here in Thailand. Uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, oh. Trade. Here we go. This is late period, and you can see the very, very delicate work here of uh, pieces laid down next to each other in this uh, Ogaibo tray. Okay. And here's a side view of the tray. You notice the very delicate and intricate work here as compared with the Chinese. And, oh, I must tell you about this. This is a sutra box. And in Munster, I was allowed to hold this and to examine it and to photograph it any way I wanted to. Um, the director there is very kind. And my friends, my Japanese friends, hand carried it from Japan to, um, to Munster. It is Korean, but it was bought by a rich Japanese, and so it's in a private collection in Japan now. Um, going on, I just love this piece, really. <laughs> it's just wonderful. Here's some more detail. Oh, no. Here's some more detail of the piece, yes. You can see the Lotus Scrolls everywhere, and this will show up later in Thailand. So this is a sutra box for Mahayana sutras, not, not Theravada, but Mahayana sutras. Okay. Um, and if I go on, you can see here the double cranes of Korean uh, rainbow or string. And notice how the pine tree is made up of strings also, all laid next, one next to the other. Uh, this is at my coffee table at home. <laughs> and here, um, recently in Korea, it's become quite fashionable to make these, you know, the name cards that Japanese and Koreans and sometimes use to exchange with each other. So um, they make these name card cases 
from Mother of Pearl Lacquer inlay. And, oh, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do this. Notice the double cranes. Sign of uh, fidelity, longevity, happiness, all kinds of good things. And the cranes dancing here, and double cranes again, double cranes again. This is a special motif in Japan called Futari Shizuka, two together quietly. And it represents the male and female birds being together in intimacy quietly. And they have even a Japanese suite used in tea ceremony with two pieces, one pink and one white. The white is the boy and the, no, sorry, the pink is the boy because boys are red. <laughs> and, and the white one is the girl tied together in this little pouch uh, to uh, consume when receiving thin tea at the tea ceremony. So these are showing some of the uh, symbols of longevity, the crane especially. And here's that scroll motif again that I keep talking about because it really is extraordinary that that had an influence on Thailand. Um, so these are laid out like the colors of the rainbow. And um, this auspicious double cranes holding branches in their beaks, um, which you don't see here, but you do see, oh yes, we do, there, the branches are here. Sometimes they're holding branches, sometimes they're holding a string of pearls. The meaning of the string of pearls is the glory of the king. These are Zoroastrian symbols from the old Sasanian culture in Central Asia. So you know how through the Silk Road we have a lot of uh, motifs from many different countries, all the way from uh, Nara in Japan to Rome in Italy. Uh, there was a long, long Silk Road, a double Silk Road, northern route and southern route. And many of these designs transferred, um, maybe strangely enough, on textiles. The Sasanians were very expert at making textiles, and so many of the motifs that we have now, like the heart motif, that was a Persian motif. It didn't exist before the Persian Empire. And when the Persian Empire collapsed, the Sasanians uh, took over and used the heart uh, motif uh, very, very often in, in their artworks. That heart that we use for Valentine's Day. Doesn't look like a real heart, actually, but stylized one. So um, the uh, Persian Empire, as I said, broke up, and then the Zoroastrian religious symbols found, that found their way into China, Korea, and Japan via the ancient Silk Road, but they took different forms in those different countries. Uh, the Zoroastrian used uh, 10 sacred symbols, including birds holding the strings of pearls in their beaks, deer, boar, next year is, is the year of the boar, etc., which when they traveled to the east were transformed into the 10 signs of longevity called Shit Jang Sen in Korean. And as you can see in, let me see if we have another, yes, in this name card case, uh, you can see some of the other symbols like the, the tortoise, uh, the water, the flying birds, the moon, sometimes the sun. These are all symbols of longevity. Sometimes there's a magic mushroom, the linchi mushroom. Um, and uh, in Bhutan, for example, rather than cranes, the raven is the royal bird. So pairs of, of ravens flying are, are used in Bhutan for the uh, 10 symbols of uh, longevity. In the East, some of these symbols were portrayed as fertile couples, birds, deer, tortoises, etc., which sometimes surrounded the old mountain sage or mountain god. You see if we have a picture of him. There he is um, in uh, Bhutan. His name is Shering Dukar. Oh, yeah, this is in my collection. It's a big long scroll. And you see the uh, old man of the mountain. In uh, Korean, he's called San Shin, or uh, mountain saint. And here he's called Shering Dukar. 
Uh, this was painted by a, a student at the academy in Timpu in, in Bhutan. And here you see the cranes. Uh, I think this is a tortoise with a very long tail, which is common, many different kinds of flowers and trees. The rushing water is important because of the life-giving force of water. And rushing, it must be rushing to show its power. The mountains, of course, a tower over us and represent contact with the gods. And then the pine trees and other trees are symbols of longevity and strength. Um, so these uh, the mountain gods have the ten symbols around them under the sun and the moon. And um, let me see if we have, yes we do. This is in the library in uh, Punaka, the monasteries, and it shows some of the cranes, because it is Bhutan, uh, and the, uh, uh, the ravens, I should say, actually. Yeah. So um, the sage god is also offering a puja, a Hindu ritual, by pouring lustral waters and uh, offering tea cakes. Uh, Bodhaka, you know, like to Ganesha or to another Hindu deity, we call Chutor in, in Bhutanese, so offering these tea cakes to the gods. And such depictions abound in Himalayan and Korean Buddhist temples, but I have also seen it even on Russian lacquerware lately. But here's the Timpu Bhutan, here's the Russian lacquerware box in the Romanov Museum. And you see, uh, once again, the old man who's surrounded by certain birds and other animals, usually in couples, and the strong mountains and the rushing waters and the tree, like a tree of life over him. And uh, again, in, in Russia, they would not have used urushio. They would have used rosins and oils from other trees. So the sage of the god is there. And the terminus of the Silk Road of these 10 symbols of longevity finds itself in the two folding screens that back the thrones of the kings of Korea, um, who, take, uh, place of, who take the place of the sage. Now, I'm going to go back a little bit to examine one more time. Um, the cranes on this name card case are surrounded with Chinese cloud motifs. Oh no, that's another one. Okay, here we go. Um, these are the Chinese <coughs> cloud motifs that you see. Uh, the influence from uh, Chinese lacquerware on Korean lacquerware. And this chrysanthemum scroll, butterflies, chrysanthemum scroll, arabesques, are reminiscent of the ancient Korean chrysanthemum scroll motif. And the one in the upper right is, is another one. This one shows cranes holding lotuses in their beaks. So lotus, of course, would be a Buddhist symbol. So this is a Korean adaptation of the Persian motif. Okay, here we can see some Chinese pieces that are in Japan. Uh, most of the Chinese pieces don't exist. They've been destroyed during different revolutions and so forth. But um, these are, uh, the one in the center is uh, a plectrum for playing uh, the pipa, uh, kind of a lute. And these are mirrors. And you can see how delicately they are inlaid. Um, they stick to the, mi the mirror is a bronze mirror, and they use a tarry substance to inlay the shells. But in the case of some of these colored ones, they are dyed. They're not natural color. And the red ones are actually um, precious stones like garnets, rubies, and so forth, and, and other uh, red stones. So, um, Yes, okay. So this is in the Shoso repository of the Imperial Treasures in Nara. 
and some of it was dyed, yes, okay. Uh, the majority of these pieces came from Tang, proving that China had mastered the art of MOP and Lei by at least the 8th century, which is the beginning of the Tang dynasty. Though many pieces can be verified from records to have been of Chinese origin, because when they were received as gifts from China, um, the Shosuing kept the records, and you can still see those documents next to the pieces laid out in the, the Shosuing repository. But we are not sure uh, what other pieces were imported directly from China or Korea, and which were made by Japanese craftsmen. But in this early uh, era, we can presume that pieces made in Japan and Korea were modeled on Chinese examples. Further gorgeous examples of Japan or of Korea were made, uh, sorry, further gorgeous examples of Japanese MOP inlay can be seen from the 12th century Konjiki Do. This is a, Do means a hall, Konjiki means golden, so it's a golden hall. And this is the mausoleum, the bodies of the Fujiwara reach, okay. In Japan, the emperor didn't rule. There was a power behind the throne. The head of the Fujiwara family always married his daughter to the emperor, and the Fujiwara regent actually ruled. So their bodies are under this altar that you see. Oh, sorry, didn't mean to go there. So the, the bodies are here, and uh, they had been mummified before they were uh, laid to rest, the uh, four, four bodies of the Fujiwara regents. I was lucky enough to go there. But you can see, like the Chinese mother of pearl, the color is gray, it's pale, it's washed out, it's lackluster. It's really not as attractive as Thai or Okinawan mother of pearl. This is in Hidaizumi, far north of Tokyo, near the old feudal capital of Sendai. Of course, you know Sendai because of the tsunami that happened there not long ago. This is where the Fujiwara family ruled. Pale, lackluster pillars, platforms. It has been deducted by Japanese scholars that the art of inlaying the MOP of the turbo shell into lacquer and then covering it with clear lacquer called in Japanese raden. So the mother pearl inlay is called raden in Japanese. This was learned by the Japanese from southern origins. That's all they'll say. They won't say where. But that could mean either southern China or it could mean Southeast Asia. Maybe they're afraid to say that they learned it from Indonesia. <laughs> Nobody wants to say that. <laughs> but it's a, it's a possible theory. <laughs> so still, most ancient Japanese works cannot match the depth of iridescence of the Thai works because of the type of shell they use. From the 16th century to the 19th century, the arts of Japan shifted their focus from serving religion and the state to making utensils and decorative items for the secular tea ceremony. Now these are writing instruments that are used uh, at the beginning of tea ceremony, showing the traditional dances. And on the uh, next slide, you see the tea containers. Uh, on the left is a wooden box, again, for, for writing your thoughts down at tea ceremony. On the, on the right, you see very heavy mother of pearl inlay on the container for the thin tea. Two cups of tea are served. One is thick tea, which everybody shares from one cup, and then after that, thin tea is served in individual cups. So this would be, oops, sorry, keep hitting the wrong button here. So th this would be the one that would be used for the thin tea, and this is the writing box. So it's called the natsume. Natsume means a jujube because it's shaped like a jujube. Uh, you can see jujubes in the Chinese markets here. And here's a covered maquillé gold box on the left with what seems to be abalone shell, which is a lesser quality shell. And here's a samurai's portable medicine chest in four layers. He would carry different kinds of medicines. And he was probably born in the year of the snake. So that's why you see the snake here. And this is in Portugal at the uh, Gulbenkian Foundation in Lisbon. 
some more uh, things for Japanese tea ceremony. This is in my collection. These are the Chinese hexagrams. Hex means six. So one, two, three, four, five, six strokes. But each one of them has a different meaning. And this one means north. And this one means south. So you have to orient your tea room to the north. And if, you're, if your tea room isn't facing the north, you put this tea tray in the room, and that makes it north. <laughs> <laughs> Silly, I know. But also, we put different utensils on each one of these. <laughs> and a letter box. Letter box is very, very important in Japan. This is lead and mother crop. Now, this is a this is a quite an unusual technique called nashiji or pear skin. It is very soft and very, very delicate, and it's mostly uh, makie. Makie means um, scattered gold, and it's inlaid with uh, mother of pearl plovers. Some more for the Japanese tea ceremony. Uh, actually, I got these in the Ryukyus. So here's your introduction to Okinawan or Ryukyu lacquer. This, as you can see, is a phoenix in flight. And this is used for semi-formal tea. This one I got from a magazine. It's a very, very new one. I wouldn't have it in my house. But <laughs> at least you see what they're doing with, with, with lacquer sometimes in the 20th century. And it is also inlaid with beetle's wings. Now, beetle's wings are used here also to, in, to inlay uh, shawls and uh, lamps and uh, altar furniture and so many different things. And it's uh, one of those arts that's protected by the queen. Just a, a look at the corner of one of those tea containers. Here you can see the oh, here, we go. here you can see the line that separates the top from the bottom from the base of the tea container, using lots of bright colors of shells and also I suspect some paint. Now. I want to tell you about the scientific, uh, well, before that, um, the uh, ships, the Ryukyuan ships, were the only ones that were allowed, along with a few Japanese ships that got the shoeing, the red seal from the emperor, they were the only ones that were allowed to trade with Siam in China. And so they carried these objects back and forth as tribute. The Siamese wanted swords and fans, and they exchanged those for the great green turban shell that they have, because that shell was used like money was used in the, in the old days. And that shell grew plentifully in Okinawa, but Okinawa wasn't yet part of Japan in those days, so they got them instead from, from Thailand. Eventually, the uh, southern clan in Kyushu invaded Okinawa, took it over, and then the Japanese got their shells directly from uh, the Ryukyu Islands. Now, some forms of Thai MLP they may have been influenced by Vietnamese models, if we can presume that the Vietnamese Emperor Jia Long, who lived long in exile in the Thai court during the reign of Rama I, may have shared something new to the Thais. But this cannot be verified. Well, it must be said that the Vietnamese use most fully the iridescent properties of MOP. So the Vietnamese, even more than any other countries, took advantage of the iridescent properties. We have less reason to posit any influence from Burma on Thai MOP uh, in Lea, although Prince Damrong um, would have us believe that um, Thailand influenced Burma. Um, there is the possible exception of the Buddha footprint in Chiang Mai Museum. And Laos, such a poor country, it didn't use MOP at all. So having shown which of its neighbors probably did not have much effect on Thai MOP, let's go directly to the discussion of the Thai materials and techniques. Newer pieces may use abalone shells, but the older works use a turbo or turban shell of better quality, sometimes called the great green snail shell. So on the left is a visible light microscopy image of a polished nacre surface. On the right is a simulated layer of nacre 
via theoretical model of NACA formation. Mother of Pearl is composed of thin, flat, calcium carbonate plates secreted by certain bivalves, like oysters and so forth, and arranged in shellfish, basically, and arranged in layers around the inside of the shell. The outside of the shell is composed of a brown, horny substance known as conchyolin, which is very important. The iridescence of mother of pearl is a result of the refraction of light through the many layers of nacre, calcium carbonite, alternating with conchyolin, each layer composed of overlapping plates of translucent aragonite mineral crystals glued together with conchyolin proteins. And this is where the light diffracts and scatters. As the rays of light pass through the microscopic layers of the aragonite and conchyolin, they reflect off the surface of these two substances in different, in different manners, uh, producing different wavelengths of light. This interference produces the rainbow effect of iridescence. The waters in which the shell is fished determine the color of mother of pearl. In warmer seas near the equator, colors range from pink through amber to black. And pigments that create various markings on the shell are also secreted by the mollusk. Thai artists use Khoi Muk pearl shell so-called because the interior is a pearl-like, glossy, white-pink, which sparkles in the light. This is, this is of the family of Turbinidae Turbo Mamoratus lin Linnaeus, and it is a kind of turbo, or round mouth, or sea snail. Now Kinoshka, the lady I mentioned before, shows that the Chinese and Japanese also use these turban shells from the Ryukyus, which the Ryukyu artists use themselves. But as imports were expensive, the Japanese and Chinese more often used a variety of less luxurious shells. And the Koreans used both turban and abalone shells. Um, there is a book called Mother of Pearl Inlay by uh, Jalut San of Biachoranda. Uh, sometimes you can buy it in the museum bookstore. And another one, the Thai minor arts in the National Museum, Bangkok, say that the Thai shells come from the Gulf of Siam. And in the treasures of the National Museum book, um, it's identified, they identify the shell as Hoi Phai, or flaming Mother of Pearl from the Torbo snail indigenous to the Gulf of Thailand. And the treasurer's book says, this particular shell, I'm catching the light, emits a deep pink and green luster reminiscent of fire opals. Well, that's true, I've compared them. They do look a lot like fire opals. Making other varieties of mother of pearl appear pale by comparison, as we've seen the Chinese and the original Japanese were quite pale by comparison. From personal experience, the only iridescence that can equal that of the Thai MOP inlay, and sometimes even surpass it, can be found in that so-called rainbow or thread MOP technique of Korea. Okay. So here are some of the tools that are used. Uh, the process of preparing and inlaying MOP is basically the same in all countries with some minor variations. Because the shells are naturally curved, it takes considerable dexterity to cut straight, flat pieces. So that, you know, the shells are like this, but they have to very carefully cut these straight, flat pieces. Now, a Vietnamese uh, artisan told me once that sometimes they soak them in, in cold water for many days, and this will soften the shell, and they can kind of press it out. But the Okinawans never did that. Only the Vietnamese seem to do that. Um, because the shells are, okay, the basic tools that are used are small saws, files, and burins, polishers. To make for easy handling, the shells are first sawn into pieces about 2.5 centimeters in length, then ground down with a whetstone. Here are some more of the, uh, uh, the tools. And this table 
uh, I'm sorry, you can't see it very well, but it shows every uh, country, every Asian country, and what kind of shell they use, what methods they use, uh, for what purpose in the church at, or in the, uh, the monastery or in the court or for home or, or and so forth. This is courtesy of Mr. Kobayashi at the National Museum in Tokyo Research Center. Um, so they grind down with a wet stone. I think I have a, a photo of that. Yes, here we go. They grind down with the, uh, the wet stone and then they attach these little platelets to a disc of wood to prevent them from snapping while being further cut to the required sizes. Uh, here you can see the outer part of the shell, the wet stone and grinding it down and then uh, the, the result here, cutting the platelets and then, oh, oh, that's the next slide, okay. Next slide is laying, is drawing the design and then laying the platelets out um, in a pattern, which will then be stuck onto the, the uh, object. Um, the design is drawn onto thin paper, which is glued to the MOP. So there's, there's glue attaching these pieces to the paper. And then while the object is still wet, now it, the object can be wood, it can be basket work, it can be other kind of woven materials, <clears throat> but different layers of lacquer, different qualities are piled up as much as 30 layers sometimes. And then while it's still wet, this paper would be reversed, so they have to plan very carefully, and then pushed onto the object and then water put on the back of the paper to dissolve the glue and then the paper can be removed and the pieces will stay in neatly where they were put. And then they can make some adjustments by using small tools if they have to move some things around. So the... Um, yes, sometimes they use a curved bow saw along the lines of the patterns. Uh, I think I have, oh yes, there we go. Uh, here's the curved bow saw that they, they can use uh, for some of the patterns, for the more delicate ones. And uh, this is, uh, it, like means the restoration of some of the finest stores in Bangkok. So this is uh, actually, it. I was there when uh, Kun Sompit was restoring the, the uh, mother of pearl inlay on the lacquered doors and windows of, of uh, Wat Rajabopit. And I took photos of him doing that. Um, the, uh, there's the inlay procedure. Uh, I think you could read that yourself uh, quickly. And then load at the side the platelets. And again, cutting and uh, filing and polishing. And here is Kunsopit um, inlaying at. Uh, what Raja Bopit, the guy that quotes as I could do. He, he was very amenable to having the photos taken. <laughs> so the Ryukyus in Japan don't use um, these knives to cut shells. <clears throat> Peculiarly, they use needles, as you can see here. They use needles to cut. So here we have the Thai way of cutting, the Ryukyu or Okinawan, and then the Japanese way of cutting with needles rather than with uh, knives and saws. Um, the best Thai workers 
can saw up to 30 to 35 platelets a day. And that's not very much in a day. And even less if the pattern is a Cranach flame, which Don mentioned the, the flame design is much more difficult to make. But it takes 1,500 to 2,000 of the platelets to cover only the upper portion of a Talm food box. So it takes months just to make the plates. And here we are, the rattan, there's a rattan base, uh, which you can see here, being held up for us. Uh, this was at the, uh, the Royal Craftsman's College, inside the Grand Palace. There's a kind of a preparatory school for high schoolers and also older people can attend. And they train people for the Chang Sipamu, the, uh, the royal uh, artisans, uh, um, like little village or, or the workshop of the Kutumantor, uh, which work for the king. So here you see some of what's called rock samuk. It's kind of a rough lacquer mixed with uh, ashes of uh, banana vines, um, banana leaves, uh, stems, uh, and many other uh, vegetable materials that are, have been charred uh, to make the undercoating. So um, the paperback pieces are then applied to the wet lacquered surface of the uh, the rattan piece, and, uh, the, and then the paper is removed, and the object is then lacquered once all over to ensure smooth and consistent drying. In Korea, and in some places in Japan and China, oddly enough, the object is first covered with a piece of linen. Now why, you might wonder, would they do that? For strength. Lacquering linen onto it first gives the body a further strength. Uh, Korea and China also sometimes add wire supports. The object is then given a better coat. Well, here's a, some of the inlay that's being put onto the object. I'm preparing the, the samuk, the charcoal. This is the, for the undercoating. And you can see him using the, the brush to apply this raksamu before the inlay. A closer view. Yeah, filling in the spaces between the shells. So this is done with that, that paste called raksamu. Uh, and we can see this also applied to the doors of Wat Pakao, the Chapel Royale of the, of the Emerald Buddha. And these are renewed periodically. It's amazing. You would think they'd be there forever, but um, I've seen them many times during my years here. I've seen them renewing the doors. And thankfully, they're allowing women to work too. And this used to be a man's job only. But now ladies are learning the lacquer techniques. I talked to uh, Princess Mahashakri Sirenhorn at one of the conferences, and she told me that she had learned lacquer. I said, well, didn't you have an allergic reaction? I couldn't touch lacquer because I would break out all over. Now, lacquer can also be used as medicine. <laughs> so it can be used to make disease or to cure disease. <laughs> it all depends on how the scientists use it. And um, so I asked her, well, did you get to make the uh, Kurang Pradab Muk? That means mother of pearl in English. She said, no, I couldn't study that far. And I said, was it because you had to become a princess? She said, yes. <laughs> Cute, really, really nice lady. Ah, so there's Wat Pakao. And here, the marvelous doors of Wat Ratchabopi, how lustrous these are. And these are regalia, uh, royal regalia and awards, you know, ribbons that would be given uh, to dele delegations or to civil servants for, uh, for their work. And you can see how very, very delicate, especially the, of course you know, the highest award is the, the uh, order of the white elephant. So the elephant's in this one. 
these are the doors of wonderful. And this is one Macau where you have dragons mostly. <coughs> um, so, okay, I mean, Buddha, yes. Uh, and that was during the time of Brahma the first. So, Japan, the Ryukyus, and Korea use other kinds of pulverized charcoal. In other cases, when the object has almost dried but is still a little flexible, the tiny pieces of MOP are forced into the lacquer on the body very delicately. I'm talking mostly about China and Korea. Uh, so as to keep the surface of the piece uniform. The backing paper is removed after the work completely dries and the lacquer surface is rubbed with powdered diamond carborundum or other powdered hard stone to restore the sheen. Japan and the Ryukyus use powdered use powdered wet oh yes powdered wet stone and oil and finally powdered deer horn instead of a carborundum. So when I went to visit those workshops it was amazing to see all the deer horns on display that were being ground up. Uh, to, to burnish the lacquer. Um, the Chinese and Vietnamese techniques for inlaying MOP differ from that in the following ways also. But here's how they differ. Before lacquering, the Chinese and Vietnamese, um, the wood is first incised. So the wood is cut first for every single piece of MOP that's going to be laid, inlaid. And then that piece is inserted sometimes by hammering and then fixed with lacquer. And if the surface has already been lacquered, the MOP platelets are first attached to it, and then the whole piece lacquered over with a thin coat, and then the design, such as facial features. So here's something that lowers the quality of Chinese lacquer. The features, such as the nose, the ears, the eyes, are cut with needles. They're, they're carved into the shell. Now, in Japan, in Okinawa, all of these things would be little pieces that are inlaid individually, so delicate and precise is the work of, of Okinawa in Japan. Um, sometimes Korean artists also cut into the lacquer itself to insert the MOP and then lacquer the whole piece over again. Let us pause for a moment to enjoy the extraordinary beauty of the doors of Wat Wacha Bolpit in Wat Pakao. Oh, oh, we looked at that already, didn't we? Oh, oh, here we go. Now, um, inside the Party Bacha collection of the Mother Pro room, there's this wonderful, um, to the left, screen. It's a double-sided screen. The first side of the screen shows the Buddha with his disciples, Shariputra. Shariputra was the best one for memorizing the sutras. And Moggallana, so the, these were his two, shall we say, favored disciples. And they're being showered with flowers from heaven. And these are the four petal prajamyan. And you can see some of the Chinese influence in the roof over the, the Buddha, some of the cloud formations also, Chinese influence. And this is the back of an abbot's chair. You know, an abbot like a, a bishop uh, in a Christian church has a special throne or chair. In this case, th these are uh, sedan chairs. They're, they're portable. They can be, they have uh, bars so that men can carry them. And this is the back showing the tepanong and some of the floral motifs uh, that came from China and Korea. In the back of the abbot's chair, okay. So in former ages in Siam, MOP inlay was used exclusively on ecclesiastical objects such as, um, I'll show you some, oh, no, yes, here they are. Uh, these are the monk's begging bowl covers, you could call Batra, and this one has Airavata, the elephant that Indra rides, three-headed elephant, and some of the, the thread type of uh, inlay from the Korean style, and another one. Now, King Rama V used to give these to the abbots 
uh, once a year for those who have high merit. And these are offering pan uh, wanfa tables. Here's a close-up of that Ayurvata. Um, there is some script somewhere saying that it was given upon the occasion of uh, Rama V's coronation to so-and-so abbot. Pantha again. Okay. So these uh, monks' bowls and offering trays, sutra covers and cases, here are especially this one, you can see the lotus scroll motif from Korea. Here are birds in the trees. This is a Persian design, two parrots facing each other. There's also a Jataka tale about the two parrots, which I've tracked down, and uh, you can read about that in the Siam Society. They have all the Jataka tales there. Um, more realistic type of vegetation and flowers here. Um, these are sutra covers, it would be directly, you know, this, the back and the front of the book, accordion style book, and then the chests that these would be kept in. This is the Ayutthaya Sutra cabinet, which is in the National Museum, which you can see anytime there. This uh, is also in the National Museum. Uh, so, the uh, note again the tendency to cover the entire surface with arabesques of uh, vegetal or floral scrolls, as we saw in the Korean rosary cases and ogival tray. The finest inlay is seen in temple doors today, such as these magnificent dragons rising up out of the water. Oop. Is this working? Yes. That's from the cabinet. Here we go. This is from Wat Racha Orot, and this shows the dragons rising up out of the waves. Look at the delicate treatment of the waves, again using this Korean method of string, mother of pearl. Very, very realistic, very fine work. Um, if you haven't seen these doors, please go see them. They're on the other side of the river. They are just heaven. Just absolutely incredible pieces. So this was the finest inlay in the temple doors since the third reign. <clears throat> now the Ayutthaya Palace Law of 1358 prescribed the MOP utensils to be given to certain royal ranks. Some examples are the umbrella of the king's sons were decorated with mother of pearl inlay and the king's grandson's MOP inlay containers and pedestals. The, me oh, go to the next slide. Yes, okay. The members of the royal family were to eat from a container decorated with turtle shell or mother of pearl inlay. And so important was the grandeur of MOP to royal prestige that the ninth king of Ayutthaya, Trilok, established a department of mother of pearl to direct its craftsmanship and limit the craftsmanship to courtiers within the royal household. So only people in the royal household who were attached to the court could become the artisans to make the mother of pearl inlay. The building itself, which housed this ministry, was made of MOP inlay and situated near a pond near the throne hall. Now you can see the ruins of the palace in Ayutthaya if you go up there. So this, this location shows even more so how important MOP inlay was to the monarchy. Now let's take a look at the Asian cultures that I'd like to suggest may have affected Thai MOP. By the 14th century, the Ryukyu Islands was an independent kingdom. Actually, it was an empire at one time with three countries within the islands. And uh, they became a tributary nation to China. China gave the Ryukyus the special term, the special name, Land of Courtesy, because they found that the Ryukyuan people were the most courteous and hospitable of all the nations they had ever encountered. So 
Liu Qiu's was firmly a part of, Chinese, of China's uh, tributary orbit and had established trade networks, which were called Hamashita, that means under the beach, with China, Japan, Korea, Siam, and other Southeast Asian states, acting as the middleman, trading goods among all these nations. Due to China's frequent imposition of the hygiene, H-A-I-J-I-N, or maritime trade ban on Chinese trade, first imposed by the Emperor Hongwu in 1371. Because of this, the Ryukyuan traders often kept the sources of their trade goods secret from nations unfriendly to one another, such as the mutual rivals, Japan and China. Japan and China hated each other, but they wanted each other's mother of pearl and other goods, swords and so forth. So how did they get it? The Ryukyuan traders keep all secrets. <laughs> and they could go anywhere. They were the best shipmen, in sailors, whatever, uh, in that area of the world. And here you can see this was from the 14th century. There are wonderful books written about this uh, by Jean Garnier. The whole story is written. One copy of the book is kept in uh, Taipei and another uh, in Singapore. But there are copies of the books you can, I found it in the National Museum a volunteer's library. Very, very interesting account of the, the, the records of Ryukyu trading. It might sound dull, but actually very exciting. So by the 14th century, Ryukyu was trading for them, and the Ryukyu trade network was like a bridge across the broad ocean. In fact, at the castle, Shirley Castle in the Ryukyus, which I've been to often, there is a big bell, and on the bell, it's inscribed the Bridge of the Nations. And it shows the different countries they went to and inscribes the names of those countries. It's a really, really fantastic uh, sign of goodwill to other nations uh, around the Ryukyus. So that bridge with its ships calling at ports all over Asia and its islands overflowed with splendid international products. I was so surprised when I got assigned to Okinawa at how incredibly rich the country was. They had all the latest music, they had all their own music, they had all the latest fashions, they had all the latest goods from all over the world, and that was back in 1963 or 70 years, I can't remember, it's a long time ago. <laughs> Even way back then, they were so advanced compared with Chicago, where I came from. So it was a, a big shock to me to see how international Okinawa was and still is. By the way, in this neighborhood, there is an Okinawan restaurant. It's a very fine one. You can look it up on Google. The name is Kinjo, K-I-N-J-O, which means Golden Castle. It's a very common Okinawan name, and I've been there many times. Very good restaurant. So um, naturally, in their... Uh, dealings, the Ryukyuans came into contact with the MOP lacquer pieces of these nations, which were used as trade or tribute. China was usually the source for so much of Asian culture, but the so-called tributary nations soon adapted the Chinese arts to the materials and customs of their own cultures and began producing their own exquisite pieces of MOP in Le lacquer. They were outstripping the Chinese at this point. Ayushia being one of the famous, the foremost among these ports, but also the Ryukyus in Korea. Out of the 145 commercial vessels that traded at the port of Ayutthaya from 1425 to 1570, 58 of them were Ryukyun uh, Shinkosen. Shinkosen means it's uh, uh, certified by the government to trade. One third of the whole total making an average of one Ryukyuan ship to a UTA every two and a half years. Royal thrones of lacquer were the usual expressions of the grandeur and majesty of Asian monarchs. By the way, royal thrones of lacquer are used by um, Armenian Orthodox archbishops and by many of the Eastern Christian bishops and archbishops uh, in the Middle East area. So quite similar to um, the, the grandeur and majesty of the Asian monarchs. 
But not even the emperor of China had such a magnificent lacquer throne inlaid with precious mother of pearl as did the kings of Thailand and the kings of the Ryukyus. So here, now it is prohibited to photograph this. Kun Chai, who was our patron of the museum, Mam Ratchuang Chitravong, uh, um, took us there and we saw this and uh, not allowed to photograph it. So I, I just scanned it from uh, Bian Chandra's book, uh, Thai Mother Pro Inlay. And this is the Ryukyuan Usakusa. I did photograph this one. And uh, you can see the red lacquer. And um, Maeda-san, Maeda is the foremost uh, mother of pearl artisan living in uh, Okinawa now. Uh, about 10 years ago, he was asked to restore the throne. So this is his restoration of the throne, including the footstool. And then on either side, there are walls and panels to screen it off, all were made by Mr. Maeda. This is a fantastic place. You can see the piece. You can see the luxury of the, of the shell here. And this, of course, is the great green turban shell, which is very plentiful in Okinawa. So when I went, I go back to Okinawa often, and sometimes when I go, I ask the uh, mother of pearl craftsman, where do you get your shells? Because in Thailand, they can't get them anymore. Because in Thailand, the waters have been fished out, and all that's left now are the babies, and it's prohibited to fish the babies, because they want them to grow up so they can get the great green turban shell again. Fortunately, the Chang Sipam of the Royal Artisans Enclave keeps a big supply of old shells, so they have enough for royal projects. But I asked the Okinawans, where do you get your great green turban shell? At the restaurant, of course. <laughs> they put it in the trash. So I asked the cook to please save the shells for me. This was Giorgio. This is an Okinawan lacquer that I met. He was telling me these stories, outrageous stories. He says, you just go in and drink some sake and you eat one of those shell, of those uh, great green turban snails, and uh, you get the shell. Or just pull it in the back sometime at night and just load up from the trash. <laughs> Incredible. These things are so valuable. Actually, you can buy one. They sell them in shops in Okinawa for 1,000 yen, which is about $10 this one, so it's not so much. You can buy them at River City, too, for about $3,000. Mm -hmm. Yes, go take a look at River City. <laughs> a little expensive. No, $1,500, I think it was now, if I can correct myself. <laughs> okay, so there's the royal thrones, but the Chinese emperor did have something. Um, but it was only a temporary uh, throne, and not an imperial throne, uh, of the uh, Kangxi Emperor that's the, during the Qin Dynasty. And if you look very closely, which I did when I, I, I saw this uh, in Berlin, I went to see this throne, it's obviously abalone shell, lower quality, which is really a shame uh, because they were really trading, you know, with the Ryukyuans, they could get the Ryukyuan more colorful, more beautiful shell if only they wanted, if they wanted to pay for it. But that's the imperial throne of the Kangxi Emperor, but it's one of the portable thrones. It's not his, uh, his, his main throne by, by any means. Um, okay. So the Ryukyuan artists, like Thai artists, have used brilliantly luminescent MOP from the turban shell because the Ryukyus is located on the northern limit here we go, of the Kuro Shio. Kuro Shio means black salt. So the Kuro Shio black current. The waters of this current are the best places for the great green turban shell to live. It has the right temperature, uh, not too much fluctuation of uh, the water, uh, move a little water so they, they live in peace there and they thrive there. So on the northern limit for Okinawan and the southern limit for Thailand. So both countries enjoy the Kuro Shio black current. And this is according to uh, uh, Naoko Kinosta, 
she said that uh, these shells, China, Korea, Japan, uh, were being exported to each other about since about 3,000 years ago because they were in such high demand among the Ryukyu's neighboring countries as a material for craft and architectural decoration, being superior in luster and depth of color to those of other countries' native nacre. The turban shells provide brilliant reds, greens, pinks, and purples. In 1372, the Ryukyuan king sent a shell tribute to China, and in 1425, cinnabar scabbards inlaid with MOP in addition to turban shells. Similar MOP and turban tribute were regularly sent until 1874. In the 15th century, the Satsuma lords of Japan invaded, just walked right in and took over the whole country of, of the Ryukyus, dethroned the emperor, uh, and made it part of their own land. So this is, you know, it's not that far from Kyushu. The Satsuma lords were reigning in Kyushu. So they made it a part of Japan, and it remained a part of Japan until I went there in 19. 62, it was returned to, 72, I can't remember now, where it was returned to uh, Okinawa. And uh, they had uh, a vote, they had the chance to decide whether they could be a free port like Hong Kong, or be an independent nation, or they could rejoin Japan again. Well, somebody paid the city hall enough money, guess who, so that they rejoined <coughs> Japan. Japanese politics is really something, kind of like Thai politics. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyway, they invaded and they established the Crafts Supervisory Office of the Ryukyu Kingdom called the Kaizuri Bugyo Show. Literally, that means the magistracy, the magistracy of shell polishing. Kaizuri is shell polishing. In order to ensure the standards of representative artwork of the Ryukyus, including MLP lacquerware. Production lasted for 500 years until the kingdom was annexed to Japan. So Ryukyu and lacquerware uses as its base the wood of the Dago tree. Here you can see the, oh, well that's the next slide, sorry. What is this one about? Oh, okay, where well, you can get the cowrie shells and so forth. Okay, here we go. So there you can see the Dago tree uh, it's a very, very interesting tree. Um, it's the Indian coral bean, or Erythrina variegata var orientalis. It's cut across the grain to get the best quality. This hardwood thrives in the south of the main island, I saw it often when I was living there, and grows naturally straight, without flaw or splits, and so is solid and durable. And Yulushi oil, that's the uh, Yulushi liquid that's uh, painted on, um, is elastic. It will change with the temperature. It will expand and contract with the temperature so it won't crack. So it's especially suited for lacquer art uh, since the wood is light, spongy, and porous, keeping a, sp a specific surface area regardless of humidity and so will not easily crack or split. So both the Urushio and the wood are important to keeping the wood from splitting and cracking. A very special aspect which really intrigued me of uh, Ryukyu and lacquerware is the use of a primer coating. Now all of them use primer, all countries use a primer coating. But the primer coating of the Ryukyus is made of a mixture of pig's blood, fine sandy clay loam called kucha, and tongue oil, T-U-N-G, oil. So it's only the Okinawans and Ryukyuans that use it. And they say it's the pig's blood that gives it the strength. They also use the pig's blood on their fishing nets to keep the fishing nets from tearing. So it's a very strong coagulant. So this is applied to the lacquer as a powerful coagulant before the lacquer is a powerful coagulant primer to fill in the porous and spongy dago wood. 
Korea had close and long-standing trade relationships with the Ryukyus and the king of Chosun, uh, Chosun was the last dynasty in Korea, exchanged diplomatic documents with the king of Ryukyus despite concerns about what would happen if China found out. They didn't care if China found out about this unauthorized relationship. Special evidence of this close ancient relation was the 1998 discovery in the royal city of Urasoe. It's a beautiful city, and that's where the Lacquer Museum is in Urasoe. This was the royal city. In the 13th century, they found Koryo Dynasty, Korean, 13th century tiles and evidence of the kiln that produced the tiles in the Ryukyuan Aso royal family tomb. So there were Korean tile makers. You may know about Japanese ceramics. It was a Korean tile maker called Chojiro who established the finest Japanese ceramics. He was kind of enslaved by the shogun, uh, but made the best ceramics. It's called Rakuware. You must have heard of Rakuware. So there were Koreans there in, um, in Okinawa that were making the tiles for the family, Okinawan family tombs, the royal family tombs. It is remarkable that the only Koryo dynasty kiln that was ever found is in the Ryukyus. None of them remain in Korea. Only the one in the Ryukyus remains. So in 1462, Korea sent copies of the Tripitaka Koryana. This is the complete the collection of the Buddhist sutras. Tripitaka means three baskets. There's the Abhidharma. I forgot the name of the other two parts. But all three parts of the, the Buddhist sutras um, uh, are kept in the Heinsa temple in Korea. And scholars come from all over the world to study because that has the most complete set of the Buddhist books. They're all digitalized and online now, so you can act, uh, access them in English, too. So um, the, the king uh, the, of Korea sent uh, a complete set of the Tripitaka Koreana to the Ryukyuan king. MOP in Le Lacquer was made in Korea as far back as the Shilla dynasty, 57 BCE to 668 CE. This was unified Shilla. There were three countries before Shilla, but Shilla conquered the other two in 57 BCE. And when there was a government sh shop, so Shilla had a government shop manufacturing lacquerware, and the exquisite splendor of the Koryo dynasty's Naljan Chi, the word for uh, inlaid lacquer. The Sino-Korean word, this is the Sino-Korean word for MOP, inlaid lacquer. This lacquer was highly praised by Sa Gung, an envoy from China's Song Dynasty, 960 to 1279. In his illustrated book of Koryo, which was titled Koryo Donggyong, he said that Koryo's Najang Chilgi, that means mother of pearl inlay, was valuable enough because it is extremely exquisite and elaborate. Other accounts claim that a Naj, that Na, a Najan Chilgi writing brush case, the case for the writing brush from the Koryo period, was one of the most coveted items among the Sung literati in China. So the Chinese wanted the writing brush cases from Korea. Unlike Unlike other craftsmen, Koryo artisans cut small, narrow MOP strips called threads, which we've talked about, rather than the large pieces, and then inlaid them side by side, one by one, to form the entire design, making a rainbow-like effect. Almost finished. Yeah, actually, I'm on the last page. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, um, unlike other, okay, so they lay these side by side, making the rainbow like effect. And um, the literati made reference to this, made reference to the ingenious method of making designs never seen before in China. And by 17. Uh, sorry, by 1272, the Koryo government had established a special shop 
to make the MOP lacquered boxes for keeping the Buddha's scriptures. So here they are here. And notice the lotus scroll motif on the uh, sutra boxes and rosary cases. Um, mostly with chrysanthemum arabesques. By the 15th, 16th century, these designs had become boldly schematized lotus arabesques and mythical, with mythical uh, Buddhist flowers, with looser forms appearing larger in size. By the 17th and 18th centuries, the motifs changed from the symbolic to favor natural plants, flowers, and birds. And by the 19th century, nature was being depicted in a more realistic manner. And we can see similar trends and motif changes in the Bangkok National Museum's collection. So here you see the peony arabesque Chosun dynasty, and the uh, chrysanthemum scroll, and here uh, uh, Ryukyu, the tray in the upper left-hand corner, very elegant, very particular, and other sutra chests. So in conclusion, Due to the frequent policy of the hygiene, the ban on trade goods imposed by China, it is quite likely that the Kingdom of Thailand had just as much or even more trade with other Southeast Asian kingdoms. And Korea and Japan, through the intermediary of Ryukyuan traders, than it did with China from the 14th to the 17th centuries. i just let you see the uh, references consulted. Thus, through the exchanges of tributary goods, Thai MOP artisans were most likely exposed to the styles of MOP work of these other non-Chinese traditions, even more than they were by the styles of China, which were already becoming decadent, as I showed you, during this period. Even as these tributary kingdoms developed their own art of MOP to such a degree as to outstrip China in quality. We have noted specific uh, similarities in style and aesthetic kinships among certain examples of Thai, Vukuan, and Korean pieces of MOP inlaid lacquer in their manner of covering the entire surface with the same repetitive geometric or vegetal pattern, especially the chrysanthemum and lotus scrolls. Due to the special role of the Ryukyus played, uh, the, the role that the Ryukyus played in the tributary trade from the 14th to the 17th centuries, and due to the close diplomatic relationships between Korea and the Ryukyus and trade between the Ryukyus and Thailand, sorry, Siam, during the same period, it is suggested that future scholarship, I'm suggesting it, future scholarships pursue these links further in order to study possible direct relationships of Ryukyu MOP and indirect relationships of Korean MOP through the UQ 